to, to explain us. And, and yeah, I mean, he has been doing models that are, are now you uh, have been used all the time by the LIGO people collaboration to for the analysis. I mean, it's one of the I think there are the different models, but one of the models that is being used uh, nowadays to, to analyze the, 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 the data is the ones that uh, Shasha and his group are, are building there. And okay, so today he will tell us about the, the, precisely the development of these things and what uh, we can do with them. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot for, for inviting me to give this talk. So, so since since you know so many people, I think I can make it as informal yeah, yeah. as possible. So you know, don't be shy to interrupt me to ask a question. I think probably I have two or three slides more than what I have time for anyway. So if I, if I do even a few you know, fewer slides, don't don't worry. Just interrupt me, and then I can maybe explain. So um, let's jump right in. This now, no. It was, working before, right? it was working before, of course. Yeah, it's always uh, okay. Fine. Um, <laughs> let's see. This still works. Okay. All right. So this is just you know, this overview slide of all this very wide range of fantastic sources that, that um, gravitational wave sources and types of signals that we expect to eventually observe over a, a wide range of frequencies with a wide range of detectors. But what I want to talk about now. Today is basically the, the kinds of sources and signals that we have seen so far, which is basically compact binaries. So what we have really seen so far is compact binaries of essentially stellar mass, which uh, when they coalesce, they emit signals roughly in the audible range and we can detect them on the earth. But then they're very similar types of signals, but uh, emitted by different types of sources in the supermassive black hole binaries that are uh, emitted at much lower frequencies. And so we have to go to space where it's quiet to observe them and then, uh, of course, this is, this is very involved in the LISA mission to make exactly that possible. Um, okay, so now this is actually this is a snapshot from some simul some numerical simulation of the of the Einstein equations, which I did quite a while ago. So it's, it's very it's very beautiful. It's, it shows how the signal travels through space time in this, in this curved space time. Um, but what we really want now is to have the long these signals that go for the whole time essentially of the in spiral and, and coalescence. And across the astrophysical, oops, sorry. Yeah, it's it's so <laughs> across the astrophysically plausible parameter space of all um, binaries of, of black holes, neutral stars, maybe more exotic objects, certainly general relativity, but even more, maybe in more alternative uh, theories of gravity. Now, uh, there's the, the no hair theorem in, in general relativity which tells us that fortunately black holes are very simple objects when they're time independent. So we can just describe astrophysical black holes by their masses and spin vectors. And then binaries are described by only nine intrinsic parameters, which is the mass ratio, the two spin vectors and two more parameters for the orbital eccentricity. Uh, the total mass uh, in GR for black holes is just a scaling factor. So we don't have to, we can ignore it for the modeling, but it's very important of course, uh, for data analysis. So here we see uh, like a simple plot double logarithmic. This is the uh, power amplitude density sensitivity of the detector for two detectors, the initial LIGO and the advanced LIGO. And then we see three signals here, the amplitude of three gravitational wave signals, they only differ by their mass. And so smaller masses are shifted to the right to higher frequencies and lower masses are shifted to the left to, to lower frequencies. So for the, for the observation, the mass of the binary is, of course, very important. Uh, and then what we get for a, a single binary is basically the signal, uh, usually the gravitational wave strain as a function of on the celestial sphere of the source, which we see here, for example, this is a processing binary, a signal movement, this is like this one here. Uh, and this is what we want to understand as a function of time or frequency across the whole plausible parameter space of this binary. So this is the challenge, this is the task that we have to do. Um, now, one little technical thing to start with, uh, one, one, one general theme of waveform modeling is always to compress information as much as possible. And so we start, uh, of course, because the gravitational wave is quite smooth, so we can uh, use, we can decompose it into spherical harmonics. So if you have the strain, that's a function of time separation and two angles in the sky, then we can just factor out, uh, because it's very far away, we just factor out one over the distance, and then we have um, a sum over different uh, terms where we have we have factored out the uh, 
the spherical harmonics, which give us the angular dependence, and then some, some mode coefficients, which just depend on time. Then we have to decide how many of these coefficients do we really need, depending on the, the accuracy that we need for the given signal. And so usually this is just a handful, four, five, maybe six. Uh, and it's these, these functions that we have to model. Usually we can then further, we split them into amplitude and phase, which is a nicer, simpler functions. And this is what, what we have to do now, but across the whole parameter space to high accuracy. It turns out that actually until very, very recently, so the first two observation runs of the advanced detector network, uh, both the models and the data analysis restricted only to the dominant quadrupole. Uh, so very, very, very simplified. And we'll later understand why, why uh, it's much better if you have more uh, harmonics. And then for example, for the searches, they still just use this. And for, in fact, for searches um, based on match filtering, we don't even use spin precession, we use eccentricity. Does, uh, um, this is basically done to reduce the number of false alarms and the, the signals are very, very oversimplified. Uh, Unfortunately, and the 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 uh, so the effect of these higher harmonics is that that um, for the dominant quadrupole this has the maximum face on and face off so if, so where the maximum um, radiation is emitted but these uh, higher harmonics they have maxima in different directions in particular more toward the um, to the edge which to, to the uh, to the orbital plane and so because they have their maxima in different directions first of all um, so for example if we look at the binary from, let's say the North Pole, we get this kind of red signal, but if you look at it more uh, edge on, for example, 70 degrees in this case, so we get less amplitude, but also we get a more complicated signal. So from the observations, of course, initially, if you just see a few binaries, we will tend to see waves that look like the red one, but as we see more, more binaries, we see some of these weaker ones, which have additional interesting structure as well. Uh, and because they have a different dependence on inclination, this helps us, for example, to, to uh, determine what is the inclination and that breaks a degeneracy between the inclination and um, and the distance, which is astrophysically very, very important because we really want to know how far these things are away. Um, right, this, is, this, is a, this is a plot of the gradation wave signal for a relatively high mass ratio, mass ratio 20 approximately binary. This is just the orbital plane and we see how the gradation waves travel in the orbital plane. And it has this very like non-sinusoidal type of oscillations. This is exactly because of this subdominant Harmonics. Sorry, okay. sorry. Yeah. I, I sure. Have no idea how to do So, can you explain again why the m equals two is the maximum out of the the n? Equals well, it's a basically this. This is very similar to um, electrodynamics, where this is a standard uh, decomposition. These harmonics, and so the the first one is the dipole, and this is the strongest, and the other ones are, are falling off. And it's basically here is very similar, but, except the quadrupole is the first. Yeah. And then the other ones they they fall off. Why m? That's why my question. So no L2, L2 I understand, right? So M2 in particular. Ah, so why is it one or M0? Well, because so usually for every L, the strongest ones are the ones with uh, the, the maximum M. I, I work on after technology and for us it's uh, always a zero. Right? It's well the if the so if the it's basically okay, but a better explanation, okay? okay. It's because these two. ones they correspond. Basically, the circular polarizations because the binary is a, a circular motion. If if I would have a head-on collision, for example, I had two black holes they collide head-on, then it's a completely different excitation, and then it's in fact the L equal two m equals zero is the dominant one, but it has very different behavior because it's basically it's not oscillatory. It's just uh, a yeah. makes sense. Yeah. So, so it's really it's it's this is not a general statement. It's about these yeah, kind yeah, of signals they have they have these terms. Okay, um, great. So, so what have we have seen? What have you seen so far? That the the LIGO Virgo Cargo um, collaboration they uh, published different kind of catalogs of the signals they found. The latest one is called uh, Gravitational Wave Transient Catalog Three, uh, third one. We have detected ninety signals depending on exactly how you count 67 or a few more with sufficient confidence that they can actually use them in proper population studies. Uh, of these uh, 63 are binary black holes that were discovered in the first observation run, two binary neutron stars, the first one discovered in the, in the second run, and two black hole neutron stars, which were discovered in the third run. So this leads to a lot of anticipation if you find anything new in the first one, that is the starting zone. Um, this is one of these plots from this paper, which shows uh, mass ratio and total mass 
and shows the uncertainties of all the events and some of them colored, some more interesting ones in color. And what we can see here that the uncertainties here in the masses are in fact quite still quite large. Depends on, for some events are larger, for the others are, are not so large. Um, but is it in all the in all the quantities, masses, spin, sky location? Uh, the uncertainties are still relatively large. Here I have plots of the spin uncertainty. So there's one half disk is for each component of the binary. And so we have inclination of this of the uh, spin vector and the, the magnitude basically. And, and so these are the ones, these are six cases where we can measure the spins more accurately. And, and we see this is this isn't particularly accurate. Okay. So the, the error bars are still relatively large. Even the identification of what is the type of source. So for example, in the absence of an electromagnetic counterpart, we essentially have to use the mass of the object to say whether we think it's a neutron star or whether it's a black hole. And so if it uh, has a mass that is larger than three masses, we don't, three solar masses, we don't believe it is, it's a black hole. But this is, this is a rather coarse argument at this point. Uh, why can we not do better than these very broad posteriors? Well, because first, the limited sensitivity of the detector, so signal to noise ratio at the moment, the maximum is around 30 or so. But whenever the detectors get upgraded, then this becomes uh, higher. And for Lisa, it's going to be thousands. Okay. Uh, and so this, this is uh, the role of uh, the instrumentalist to make, this, to, to make the instruments more sensitive. And my, my role is to uh, fix this problem that the waveform models are not perfect and they have various deficiencies. Um, lack of accuracy for the signals that they model and then um, limits in the, the uh, parameter space coverage that they, that they can model. And we have to improve this as well. And sometimes and this is more physically interesting when they, what I mentioned before, when the mass is very high, then the signal is uh, shifted to low frequencies. And then I can see just a few cycles. Uh, some of these high mass events are particularly interesting, for example, to find intermediate mass black holes. But for these, we see very few cycles. So there's a famous case, GW 1905 21, that was very, very interesting. Uh, but for example, this one, it has, just has a few cycles. So then, uh, we believe it's a black hole because mm, well, what else could it be? But of course it could be a, a boson star or you can make any, any kind of theory because we just have very few cycles of information. Um, but when the, when the uh, band of sensitivity detector becomes wider then we have more cycles and then maybe we can say what this, what such an event would be. And then one of the main things that we wanna learn is of course, what, what, is the, what are the formation channels? What is the population of these kind of binaries? And so this is one of the few of these plots from the latest paper by the collaboration on this topic. And one, what one can see is that what was already hinted at in the previous catalog. So for example, this is the, like the differential merger rate versus the mass of the primary. One can see there is certain uh, structure. We don't even know what, what it is, but, but uh, hopefully in the next uh, um, observation one or four, it's gonna start at the moment, the schedule will start at the end of May. And will last for a year and a half. We will have uh, observation of hundreds of binaries. Maybe we can track this a little bit uh, better and eventually more and more um, structure will emerge and hopefully we can understand what so, exactly so is going the, on. The, the, lines, not the green is the real detection. Um, I, I have to say that I, I don't really remember right okay. now. I have, I have to check it. I have to check it again. It's basically, it's a, it's a comparison of different models yeah. with, with error bars. And so what, what basically what it shows is that, that different models give relatively similar um, predictions. So these models are all quite ad hoc, uh, but you can see that there's a certain robustness because different models give you relatively, relatively similar um, structure. And some of this substructure like Maxima is to a certain degree okay. is shown by different models. Uh, by much more, I wouldn't interpret it. These point. models in the past were not predicting, for instance, the first line of software, right? And so they were adjusted uh, uh, posteriori, right? These ones were certainly uh, adjusted posteriori, although I would, I mean, I think there was a reasonable prediction of more or less what, at least what the masses would be of the first ones, with, but, but it's Polish people. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, Bolik, for example, which in fact, in fact, they announced this at the San Kugat meeting, oh, yeah, yeah. which which created a lot of excitement of the numerical relativity people because um, um, they said it's very high masses. For very high masses, you can see the merger, so you really need all the information from the Eisen equations. Whereas if the masses are very low, uh, you have what we saw before. Basically, if the mass would be very low. Okay. 
Optimuna. The mass is very low. This is a low mass binary. Then you shift um, the wave from to high frequencies and the merger, basically you don't see this because it's covered by the noise. So this was fantastic news. But many of the data analysis people that had thought for a long time, neutron stars and, and so on, that they ignored that. And it's more, for example, this, the wave from model is that, yes, <laughs> great, fantastic. And it wasn't actually so much of a surprise. So, but yeah, uh, but it was certainly not you know, a high degree of understanding. Uh, um, and the, I think the most, the most uh, well, we have very poor statistics, but it, it looks like there could be really different, um, you know, different kinds of subpopulations. And of course, this is what we hope for that, that like interesting things happen. Um, all right, and then just to mention that briefly, of course. So one thing that I haven't mentioned here, one very interesting application is test of general relativity, uh, which you can do all kinds of things that you could not do before. And another one is, of course, uh, cosmology is tracking the expansion history of the universe. It's which is easiest if you have electromagnetic counterparts, but even if you don't have that, if you just have a lot of black holes, for example, then you can correlate them with um, galaxy catalogs, and even then you can do things. But I don't want to go into this. Just flash this as one of the interesting um, applications. I, I will completely focus on the modeling of the gravitational wave signal, but but it's of course important to mention as multi messenger astronomy, if you can see other signals, so electromagnetic ones or, or neutrinos or other things, then you can uh, learn much more. And this has been kicked off by the this discovery of the binary neutron star merger, but probably um, there's also there's been a lot of Spanish uh, contributions I'm sure you have <laughs> Several co authors on this in this institute, maybe some of you uh, have been on this. The, the ones in the, uh, the people in cosmology, I think that in the list. Uh, the yeah. So this, this has been very exciting, but but it's really not my my thing. Um, and then there has been a lot of progress, and so now we have a whole network of these detectors uh, in place. We have Kunon, of course, it's like a Virgo. Um, the Japanese detector Kagra is, has already been operating, not at sufficient sensitivity to really see anything, but this sensitivity is, is uh, uh, increasing very rapidly. And then in current in construction is like India. Why they've put one in India, uh, this can be relatively easily explained. This, this, actually, this is a very old plot. It shows the ellipsis, which is the accuracy of how uh, well we can pinpoint the source in the sky. And then basically, the more you spread these detectors out over the over the globe, you have you can triangulate the signal better, and you have more accuracy in pinpointing the signal. Um, so that's why they moved one detector from here. We had two to move one to India because this works much better. And that's of course it's particularly important for um, multi-message observations because you have to have some idea of where where is this thing in the sky to find a counterpart. Um, all right. So this is this is the the current plan of of how uh, the runs are going to go. So the next one is 04, which will have again improved sensitivity. Oops, that's not what I wanted. I forget to use that. Um, and it's currently scheduled to start in May, which I think is quite realistic and it's going to be for a year and a half. And then there's going to be another break. Um, and then we go for 04. So in, in 04, sorry, 05. in 04, we hope to see a few hundred signals and in 05, one or two a day or so. So not, not so what in terms of what they have improved in the hardware what will, what will improve from all to all five yes. what they have I mean they have they have they have made various uh various improvements to to various parts of the hardware which I'm the last person to uh to say <laughs> to say anything reasonable about okay I have the I I you know I can see the, the so at least for LIGO I have a similar plot for Vigo you can see how the sensitivity curves go down. Mm -hmm. And you can see it's both, so you can see it's both at high frequencies and at low frequencies. So the, the various improvements that have been made to optics and the insulation and seismic insulation, all kinds of things, but still no, none of the big things that will come eventually like um, like cooling it down or anything of the going underground after that. So, so still relatively conservative changes. Um, but yeah, oh, oh, is the design sensitivity, right? Like the one that was so in principle, in principle, oh, the design sensitivity is O4 now. O4 is so uh, O5 is basically you see that this is A plus. So that's uh, so O5 like, is beyond uh, the site. And there's currently there's there's a whole upgrade plan. There's essentially there's, there's a continuous upgrade plan, which will take us all the way to really new installations, separate installations with 
with um, better sensitivity, but it's like a continuous plan. Until then, there will be various, various upgrades. Um, and, and of course, so for, for people like me that do the modeling, but also for the data analysis people, the larger these gaps are, the better. <laughs> because then we can really improve the algorithm. And then the, the distance, this is for binary neural stars, right? Uh, this is the binary neural stars, yes, right. Exactly, because yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, because because so, so binary neural stars is, is more like a standard candle. So for that, uh, uh, whereas black holes, you would have you know, a, a very large range. Um, okay, so, uh, and then, so what I mentioned that the, there's a horizon to go to much upgraded um, instruments. So gravitational wave detection in space, in particular LISA, and I, I don't have to tell you about this because I'm sure Carlos keeps you updated <laughs> about, <laughs> about these things. Um, and, and then search, so for sure 3G, so third generation detectors on the ground. And this is, uh, there's a, a European project, which is the Einstein Telescope, which has now been included in the S3 roadmap 2021. So presumably it's actually going to happen. Lisa seems to be uh, going forward and that's happening. So this is this is very positive. And then in the US, there's like a similar project plan, which is called the Cosmic Explorer, which also lies in the stage where they set up the collaborations. So all, all of these things have at the moment have a lot of momentum and are going forward. As you see this, this um, different stages of improvement that are currently being planned. Uh, low frequencies, essentially, you see heavy black holes, and then high frequencies when you improve there, you see uh, binary neutron star mergers, for example. At the moment, we just see the in spiral, and then you would really see the merger and the post merger, which has new physics. That is very interesting. And this is a very old plot, which probably all of you have seen at some point. So, these are the ground based detectors, their sensitivity is improving, space based ones, and then there's post of timing, which is yet another technology at much lower frequencies. And then the, the really Exciting thing is when you when you look at how bright or loud the signals are that one can detect. So there's some numbers here, which is signal to noise ratio, but in particular, depending on the total mass of the of the thing, the redshift, and you see that you can get to really really high uh, redshift. So essentially, um, you hope to to see all black hole mergers throughout the history there's, of the universe. There's a there's a hole here where basically we don't have a detector here, but there are other Space space, so there's Lisa, Lisa is here, and there's this, basically this corresponds to Lisa, this corresponds to 3G. There are uh, instruments like the Psycho, this is a, uh, a Japanese plan. So if this flies, then it would also fill in this the white hole in here. And we have really see basically all black hole mergers throughout the universe, which is very, is very exciting. Okay, now how so how does data analysis methods work? And there are basically two classes of these methods one is for unmodeled searches. So that's of course very very important because if you if you can only find what you're looking for, you might miss the most interesting things. That that would not be that would not be very good. And what this is usually based on is this time frequency pattern recognition. So this is time frequency plane. There are some patterns which correspond to to a signal, and you just recognize this with, with various measures. And in principle, you don't have to tune this to any model. Usually they are weakly tuned to some models to optimize them a little bit, but it's still. Mm, Tuning them in a very good way, but if you can understand your signal, what is the example you are showing there? This is this is I think this is even the first detection. Yeah, uh, that, that that looks like the first detection. Uh, so this is this is this kind of signal where you see that as time progresses, it becomes uh, louder and higher in frequency. So this is this chirp signal that uh, that is familiar. And then, and then, in this case, this detector is, is uh, had better sensitivity. Yeah. Well, point two second duration. It's very, very short. Yeah. So basically, by yeah, by the by the, by the duration, I would say this is yeah, this is, is the first time. detection. Um. So if if you can model the signal, so really calculate, essentially from from first principles, from general relativity or whatever your theory is, what the signal is supposed to be, uh, then you can apply matched filter analysis. Hmm. That's the, that's the optimal analysis, given if you assume that your waveform model is in fact accurate and you use this as a signal template. And essentially what you do then is um, you compare the data with the signal, essentially computing a scalar product between the, the data and the signal. So for example, this, this kind of integrals that would be the, the signal to noise ratio squared that you can uh, observe. And then this is a little movie here that uh, I can play. So then you basically you time shift, uh, you time shift a template versus the signal. 
you compute the signal to noise ratio and where they coincide in shape, not in magnitude, then you have a peak and you say, okay, um, then you have to think about your background. <laughs> what is the background that this happens by chance? And then you say you have a detection. And the whole um, logic in some sense is, is a bit like uh, using a, an app like Shazam, except in this case, you know, what's the music catalog? And in our case, we have to calculate this from the actual equation. That's what we do. Um, so, and then of course, the, the, the idea of the, how well this works, how well you can identify the sources is limited by the sensitivity of the detector and also by the accuracy of your model or how it's fidelity to the actual physics. And you want to do this as, as well as you can. Um, for, for the current detectors, um, this, this procedure is split into two parts. So essentially first you do the, the searches and you ask, you know, can I find something? What's the statistical evidence for doing that? And you do this with, essentially you can do this with a fixed grid of templates, many hundreds of thousands, but you can do this with a fixed one. Uh, if you do, if you use templates, if you use unmodeled searches, we don't use templates. Um, then you don't, you don't for the detection, you don't need a model. Where, but even in that case, where you need a model, when you want to test how sensitive is your pipeline, your code to astrophysical events, you have to basically have to simulate uh, with, with injections. You have to simulate events and then find, check how many do I find. And only then can you infer what's the astrophysical rate for particular for particular types of sources, which is what you do, what you need to do exercise with that. Um, and then if you have uh, modeled, so in, in the second uh, in the second step, then you can do Bayesian parameter estimations, so Bayesian inference, and this you don't use a, a grid, but you use uh, you vary your templates continuously with random walks in the parameter space, for example, using Markov chain uh, Monte Carlo or nested sampling or, or techniques like this. And then you get posterior distributions for the parameters that you're interested in. In this case, for example, it's the final spin and the final mass uh, of the black hole, which is uh, astrophysically interesting. Of course, uh, because you're using uh, Bayesian um, methods, the results will depend on the priors that you set, which will have some astrophysical uh, motivation, but in particular, if your posteriors are rather broad, the results will depend on, on what priors you assume. And then you can write many, many papers assuming different priors and different, you know, different results, and everybody's happy. Um, and, and so in this case, this is also for the first detection, you see, for example, two models have been used, which have strange names, IMR Phenom and EUBNR. And luckily in that case, they give very similar results. And you say, okay, I trust, I trust this. Uh, and basically what I'm doing is, uh, I'm responsible for this one. <laughs> what I do. Um, all right. And then, yeah, I wanted to mention also this that uh, in the future, in particular for Lisa, all this workflow may look very, very different because at the moment, the data stream is actually um, dominated by noise. Occasionally, there's a signal, but it's basically noise dominated. And Lisa is going to turn this around. And the data stream is, in fact, dominated by the signals. And you have many, many overlapping signals. And so it's it's uh, it's much more complicated to analyze. In fact, you have there was some kind of global fit for all these overlapping signals and the noise together. And people think they they are developing methods to, to figure out how this works, but this is still it's a long way to go. Um, okay. So uh, so now we have to construct this model. So how how we do that? Let's do another visual. Thinking using the, the signal of the first detection because it looks very simple. So uh, physically, when the, when the binary is further apart, there's this in spiral motion, a slow in spiral, the binary gets tighter, there's a merger, and then eventually there's some kind of ring down, relaxation, uh, damped, damped sinusoidal oscillations that relax us to a final stationary state, which is, we assume, a curved black hole. And here one can see some black, the separation decreasing, and the, the relative velocity of the black holes increasing to about roughly 60% of the speed of light in that case. Um, the other cases can be much more. And when, so when these black holes are far apart, what you can do is perturbative methods, in particular something which is called the post Newtonian expansion, which is an expansion, the velocity divided by the speed of light. And this works extremely well and, and generations of people have worked on this and pushed it to very high orders. Uh, but of course, once the velocity gets sufficiently large, then this breaks down. In fact, um, so it completely breaks down maybe around here, but already gets pretty bad even before this picture starts. 
Um, and so you have, then you, you, you have to use a, a direct solution of the Einstein equations, which doesn't rely on any perturbative arguments. And that's what you do by solving them as partial differential uh, equations directly. And that's the field that is called a numerical attitude. So that's what you have to use for your last, at least maybe 10 orbits or so, if you want to be reasonably accurate. Um, all right, so this, this is just the, the, the thing that we have seen before, just to see now again, what are the different phases um, of the, the frequency domain as compared with the noise. So at early frequencies, we have the spiral, and then later here with this kind of knee, we have the merger and the ring down to a stationary final state. There are also other, various other uh, types of perturbation theory that are important. Um, and one that is particularly uh, worth mentioning is what is called the self-force approach. Uh, this is an expansion to mass ratio. So this is what you have to do when the mass ratio is very high. And main physical application for this is LISA because you can have essentially stellar mass objects falling into a supermassive black hole at mass ratios maybe of a million. Uh, and uh, this is very hard to describe by numerical methods because of these extreme scales, but uh, it's natural for a um, very sophisticated type of, of um, perturbation theory. This very standard diagram, which is somehow here is cut off. No, I can see. This perspective. I actually can see. It. This is just this is a diagram, basically this mass ratio and how compact the binary is and where these different methods work. So if the, if the binary is not very compact, you can use Positonian expansion. When the mass ratio is very high, you can use a cell force. And when the binary is quite compact and the mass ratio is massive, basically comparable, then you can use numerical relativity. And this, this white zone here where nothing works, this is essentially it's, it's a, a question of cost. If you pay enough, then you can make this more accurate and longer and you feel, you feel in the white space as well. Uh, but there's certainly there's some, some overlap between these, between these different uh, methods. In those simulations, you said in the beginning when you have binary, you have mm -hmm. 10 parameters. Uh, what, no, what the mass ratio? Yeah, right. The manifold. So, so what does prevent you from using a machine learning method, for example, to avoid every time doing the, the GR calculations? Or I'll, I'll, let, let me explain how, let me explain how to do the model and then I will go back to it. Okay. And basically the answer is machine learning is one of the things that you might consider, but just by itself okay. isn't gonna work, basically, basically, okay? This is what, now this is what I, for example, I have students that they work on waveform modeling. And then because of the children now, they say, well, if I use Python and I use machine learning, what, what can go wrong? And then no, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not quite as easy as that. Um, <laughs> this is what happens. This is, yeah. I know people are solving now the is with, with machine learning. They're starting to do I, I, I know. I, 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 I'm happy to just, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, well, what I wanted to mention very quickly, so this, this, uh, so doing numerical solutions of the Einstein equations, that was for, for decades was some kind of holy grail problem in particular, in particular applying this, uh, to black holes. So first of all, the Einstein equations, I'm sure. You're well familiar, they, they don't naturally have an initial value problem. You say, okay, what are my initial data? What, what happens in the future? And, and so it uh, only started in the 1950s to understand how this actually works, how to formulate an initial value problem. Then GI is a, is a gauge, it has constraints, all kinds of uh, complications. So this is something that is very, very uh, complicated. And uh, so how to do this really, this, this took about the mid 2000s to understand even just theoretically. People started, uh, uh, numerical relativity in the, in the early 60s with the early IBM computers. In fact, the first author here, Susan Handis, was at the time she was uh, at IBM because you really had to have experts in, in doing these kind of things. And then so, so for several decades until 2005, progress was very, very slow, uh, really having to understand how things really work. And then there was some uh, surprise breakthrough in 2005. And since then, uh, this has... Uh, increased very, very rapidly and people have figured out how to do things. There was an initial really gold rush. But I think for our purposes, what is uh, important to understand, this was exactly 10 years before the first detection. So basically from, from just being able in principle to compute such a signal or the whole signal from the in-spiral perturbatively to the merger ring down uh, to actually identifying uh, the first detected signal was just 10 years. So the first simulation is what is basically half an orbit and this, this signal. 
Um, so, so basically it's like three PhD theses. People went from this to having the kind of waveform models that, that allow us to say this uh, binary has this mass and this spin and it's there. And this, this was quite uh, a challenge. Now, now we have to do the same thing uh, for Lisa basically, uh, which I think is a larger challenge. Um, and then just to mention, and this, this is just one, one of the recent simulations, one, one simulation that I was running now, for example, this is for a highly processing binary at mass ratio about 20. Doing this, now we can do much more, but doing this also costs about a million hours on Mare Nostrum and so on. Of course, since I'm in Barcelona, I have to mention that uh, Mare Nostrum. So, so yeah, Mare Nostrum 4, this is what you use all the time and now we're waiting for Mare Nostrum 5, which is behind this. Okay, so um, I don't wanna really talk about um, numerical relativity very much. I want, just wanna mention two or three key things. First of all, if you have just black holes, the solutions are actually very smooth, so you can use high order finite difference in spectral methods. But a lot of the trouble goes into, first of all, um, dealing with black holes, which are like causal membranes that cause a lot of trouble. And you have very different length scales, so you need quite sophisticated mesh refinement. And in the end, each simulation, depending on where it is in the parameter space, takes you maybe a hundred thousand to a million or two million core hours. So these are this is relatively difficult. And uh, so the parameter space is nine dimensions for just for black holes. So covering the parameter space is difficult. I think since I've been at, at UIB, I think I used about 150 million hours for this. And I made a quick calculation, maybe in total in the field on the order of 10 to the nine hours have been used on that. Um, and so, so what one has to realize the coverage of the parameter space by numerical simulations will always for the foreseeable future be very sparse. There's no way around this. And so we will have to make some trade-offs between the accuracy and how much we cover the parameter space. So then the, the, the game is all about so the logic we have a great hours resulting how many templates? What, um, how many simulations have been done in, in total? I would say at the moment we have simulations which, which, which um, satisfy some, let's say some reasonable quality criteria, a few thousand. In total, three, four thousand. I would say on this order, so we have. Sorry. Yeah, million hours. Um... No, not not all of them. So, so when I mean, when 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 they have equal mass and little spin, for example, that is not quite expensive. But you know, the more challenging ones, they they uh, they cost about this. Um. So we so we cannot. We cannot get what we want because there are trade-offs. It's too expensive. So the question is, can we get at least what we need? Um, so there's there's several approaches to give us that. The different brands, if you want. There has been a lot of cross-pollination and, and, and competing ideas. So this is quite fruitful. I will not talk about the problem to to, to Emrys because this is a, a whole thing uh, by itself. I will I will focus on what has been done. But it's more comparable mass up to maybe mass ratio 20 or so, the kind of things that we uh, ob observe now or that we expect when you have a major merger between two galaxies, the black holes and two galaxies. So these, these brands are, they're called EUB, IMAR Phenom, and then ROM. Um, so just for the moment, just some name. Um, this development of these things has started outside of these big collaborations, but has been entirely absorbed. Uh, so all, at the moment, all of the people developing made from models that have all become part of the LIGO variable collaboration because it's not just uh, the theoretical development that you have to do. The code implementation is all open source. In fact, uh, all LIGO variable code has to be open source before any analysis. It's not that they make an analysis to make it open source, but always has to be the other way. Um, the implementation, the testing, so for example, review, the official reviews, a review easily can take half a year. We're testing it to death. Um, maintenance, and then also uh, the waveforms people are involved a lot in the interpretation of the results because they understand what are the deficiencies of the models. Um, and so when, when the question is about, is this strange effect coming from the noise? Is this coming from the waveform models? Is it coming from the physics? We have to help and, and help interpret what is uh, going on. And so these three brands, they address these, these trade-offs uh, in different ways with different strategies. And so the main emphasis is this effective one-body approach, which in a way that is the oldest, focuses on analytical methods, 
the computer waves from the dynamics. So you model things like the energy, the Hamiltonian, the flux, these kind of uh, physically quantitative um, uh, kind of qualities. And you do this by a technique which basically considers a particle moving on a geodesic in a, in a, in a curve, defective, and physical metric. And this gives you some ordinary differential equations which you can integrate. Problem is this is very slow. So this may easily take you several seconds uh, to integrate that or maybe half a minute, minute. And this is very slow because if you want to use, so basic inference for gravitational waves maybe takes 10 to the six, 10 to the seven evaluations. So this is, this is much too slow. Um, but so this is the so first uh, answer to basically your question is now you make a model. Uh, in this model, you, you synthesize this model from different types of perturbative approaches, extra physical insight that you have which you use to, to concoct some kind of ansatz. And then you calibrate that with the few sparse numerical simulations that you have. And how exactly you do this and how you combine the information, that is the art of the game, okay? Um, so th this is one way of doing that. Um, and another way that has that's also very uh, used is, is um, what is called surrogate models. It's basically using some sophisticated algorithms to interpolate large parameter spaces. And this has been used either directly on uh, numerical relativity data sets or to simply take this model and make it faster because it's too slow. Uh, and another thing is uh, that this some of combines uh, aspects of these two, that is phenomenological waveform models or by the name of the implementation in the, in the code IMR phenom. This is what we are doing where you model the waveform directly. And the way that you do this is basically by just very quick piecewise closed form expressions. Okay. So the so so the philosophy is essentially in surrogate models, these are a, a very, very fancy way of making a, a, a spline through so parameter space and through the waveforms. And so then you say, okay, but I, I understand more physics, I can use more physics. I don't have to use a sophisticated um, spline, I can, I can um, adjust my basis functions to reflect the physics, okay? And then I can make it, I can compress the, inf uh, the, the information more, I can make it faster and, uh, and use more physical intuition really, no, not, not in the physical quantities somehow, the creative dynamics, but directly in the waveform. And this is, this is basically the fastest and most robust thing that people have come up with. And this has been used for all the analysis of all the events to date. The other two have also been used a lot, but the one that has been used all the time is, is basically this one and because it's, it's, it's fast. Um, all right, so how would you do that in principle? How would you go about this? Um, so first, basically you, ha you have to, you have to um, find some simple functions that you model, the simplest possible things that you can describe. So for example, these spherical harmonic modes and then the amplitude phase, but you could make other choices. In the AOB, the energy and the radiant energy, for example, and other things like this. You have to decide whether you want to do the frequency domain or the time domain. The frequency domain is much better for the analysis because since you characterize the noise in the frequency domain, usually you want to work for the analysis in the frequency domain. But of course, in the time domain is much easier because you have better physical understanding about the dynamics. Um, all right. And then the way that you proceed is you first have to discretize whatever answers you're thinking of, you have to have a discretized version of that. So because I'm going to reduce order model, reduced order model or ROM. And you can do this in many ways. Uh, you can reduce to some um, phenomenological coefficients, which is what, what we do. You just grid it up. You construct some basis functions, maybe directly from the waveforms. There are many ways of how you discretize that. And then you do two levels of fits first. You have to fit the answers that you come up with to each waveform in this catalog of numerical data. And second, then you get some generalized coefficients across the parameter space, and then you fit these coefficients across the parameter space. So you need to basically two levels of fits. And all of the brands of modeling that I have presented, they all use that in various forms. Okay. And of course, in, prin in principle, you could then use machine learning for, for both of these uh, uh, steps. And in, in fact, one of the things that we're doing now in, in my group, for example, is to see how we can use machine learning for the second step. And then the big 
The big problem is basically here to, to, to control the overfitting. Uh, and, 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 and so that's, that's what we're fighting for. And, and I'm coming to the conclusion that, that um, it's probably not really going to work to use machine learning somehow by itself, but you have to try some kind of hybrid approach where, where you, so you factorize the problem into different levels that you understand to different degrees so that you understand as much as possible in other ways. And just for the things that are really small, but higher dimensional complicated corrections, then for them, maybe neural networks seem to be actually quite a good choice. Um, all right. So uh, a, simple, a, simple, a simple exercise, for example, to how, to how to do that. In fact, a warm up example, in fact, the one that I might like, first thing that I actually tried, and in, in a way that works quite well, you could just take a single spherical harmonic, dominant one, for example, a small, part of the parameter space, just a few points, maybe in frequency space for the amplitude and the phase, then just use polynomial interpolation, interpolation and also in the parameter space and reconstruct the waveform as a spline. This is it would be a data set, for example, for the amplitude that you can use after some clever factorization. And it, it wouldn't be too bad. This would be certainly good enough for the first detection, okay? It's just, you can do much better and you can do much better to avoid your underfitting and, and overfitting. And, and getting to the accuracy and computational speed and so on that you really want. But the, but the basic is that, okay? Basics is this. Now, what, what do we do in specifically in, in our approach, basically? So we, we split the waveform into several regions that connect it up to some order of differenti differentiability. If you have more regions, it's, it's simpler to model. If you have many, many regions, basically just make a spline. All these models are the same ansatz. Um, but it is simpler, but if you use fewer regions, then you can use more uh, physical intuition. And what we usually do is use the, at least three regions, like shown here for the, for the amplitude and the, the, the phase derivative, uh, which is the in spiral, where you can use uh, um, quality, quantitative information uh, from the perturbation theory. We can, use, we can look at the ring down, where again, you can use quantitative uh, information from a different type of perturbation theory. And then there's some kind of intermediate region uh, where we don't really have uh, any kind of perturbation theory that tells us anything, at least not yet, but at least it's kind of short and relatively simple. And so that's why you split it into three regions. And this, we have been doing this for a while, uh, since 2007, with different generations uh, of, of such models. And all of these models, they have become standard tools in gravitation wave data analysis. And the last thing that we have done is basically like the fourth generation, which we have, which from this, this one, this has taken a development time about five years. So 10 people, five years approximately, that's what it takes to do a new generation of, of that, which describes uh, also subdominant harmonics and precession and all kinds of, and all kinds of things, but not as accurate, as accurate enough that we really, really, really need now. But for example, not quite as sufficient for all four. We have to make some improvements and, and certainly not enough for at least all right. Now, I want to explain a little bit more about the physics. So let's try to understand a little bit spin. Spin gives us um, six of our nine dimensions. So that's a very uh, important uh, effect in the parameter space. The, ba the basic behavior we can uh, understand just from this post Newtonian uh, physics. And the leading order effect is, is the spin orbit uh, interaction, which is, this is basically, this is the Hamiltonian. And so this is just the scalar product of some kind of average spin and the orbital angular momentum. And then the evolution of the spin, this depends on the cross product. So when my uh, spin is in the same direction or on the opposite direction as the orbital angular momentum, that has an effect on this, but the spin evolution is zero. So these spins stay put and so, uh, I will have an effect like that where the spins are orthogonal to the orbital plane and my waveform is rather silly, okay? Relatively simple. Uh, however, when the spins are orthogonal to the orbital plane, so, so this one, with that, and if, yeah, what I wanted to say, so in this case, you have a three-dimensional parameter space. So basically two spin components and the mass ratio three dimensions. This is relatively uh, under control. There is, uh, one combination of spins, which is like the average one that we measure, okay. The subdominant one is the spin difference and that we basically don't measure that yet with the sensitivity that we have. 
But when you have spin components in the orbital plane, like in this case here, then the spins become their time dependent. And so you get a very complicated processing motions of the spin, processing motion of the spin and also of the orbital plane. So that becomes very complicated. And then the signal also becomes very complicated uh, because basically the, uh, as the orbital plane changes, the maximum emission direction is orthogonal to the orbital plane. And this gives you a very, very complicated signal. Um, all right. So this basically made people very, very uh, pessimistic about being able to discover to, to cover the parameter space, in particular with expensive numerical relativity simulations, because this seems just a bit too difficult. How much time do I have? In this um, so I will. Uh, anyway, this thing, I wanted to talk more about the introduction, but these things, and I will go quite uh, fast. So when we don't have precession when we just have this three-dimensional parameter space, then because it's just three dimensions, the physics is relatively simple. We have been able to cover the parameter space with our simulations relatively densely. And so even for relatively challenging um, uh, events, this one is from GW 19 or 412, which has strong um, uh, subdominant harmonics, for example. Then if you look at parameter estimation results here, this is the component masses. So you see that this is actually not perfect. The three of these models, they agree very well, but one is off. But the one that is off is exactly the, like the one that comes from a previous generation, which hasn't been calibrated for numerical relativity. And the ones which have actually been calibrated to these numerical simulations, they basically all agree. Not, not exactly to the accuracy that you would, let's say, for, really need for LISA in order to not reduce what you can really learn. But this, is, this certainly could be achieved. Okay, so for the moment, this is this is this this is fine. Um, but if you go to the much uh, larger parameter space, then things look uh, much sadder. However, there's one one thing that you can do. You can realize that um, if you have precession, the precession time scale is much larger than the orbital time scale. So that because um, gravitational waves are created by acceleration. The time scale is slow, so precession um, dynamics doesn't radiate much gravitational waves, and so it doesn't co contribute much to how fast this binary uh, hardens. And and so in approximate way, you can just factor out the um, some of the the phasing, so how how fast this thing hardens and becomes tighter, and how the spins and the orbital plane shakes around and makes this complicated uh, amplitude modulation. And so you can just factor these things <laughs> out, okay? And so you can either use this to, to improve the conditioning of how you calibrate the model, or you can say, well, because this, this precession tumbling of the orbital plane, this is relatively slow. I can actually, uh, I can describe this by this perturbative post-Newtonian expansion. So this, this post-Newtonian results that give me essentially the Euler angles by which I have to uh, rotate the like non-processing uh, orbital plane, then you can you can do this like hybrid approach where you model very accurately what happens in the three-dimensional parameter space without precession, um, and you use for the rest you use perturbation theory, and this is what basically everybody is doing. Okay, um, and so this so this way we can actually describe the uh, processing uh, seven-dimensional parameter space to some reasonable degree of accuracy, at least for the current detectors, or maybe for O1 and O2. Now we have to do a little bit better. So this is one thing that, that is useful. Then um, I just mentioned, want to mention this very, very briefly. I haven't talked about eccentricity. So when you have eccentricity, you will get much more complicated waveforms. So the amplitude and the frequency change when you're closer or, or further away during the orbit. Eccentricity is quite rapidly radiated away. Um, when, the, when the binary spirals together. Uh, so that's why it wasn't initially so urgent because you will not expect to see a lot of eccentricity. However, eccentricity is an important marker of dynamical capture formation of the binary. So this actually has to physically very uh, important. And now we have to try and, and model that. And also in this case, because uh, if, if these black holes are spinning, if there's dynamical capture, the spins are not correlated you will actually not expect alignment of the spins. You will have this complicated precession and you really need generic waveforms that describe the whole nine dimensional parameter space. Uh, doing some waveforms which give you that 
is, isn't very hard. And this is one I did yesterday. So this is a generic eccentric and processing waveform. Um, and, and it took about 20 seconds to produce with Mathematica. Problem is it's only post Sladonian. It doesn't have a merger and it takes 20 seconds. And what it would be nice to have it, let's say hundred milliseconds. Otherwise uh, it gets very expensive for data analysis and basically doing that and finding new ways of combining analytical results and, and sparse numerical simulations to get complicated wave waveforms like these more accurate. That's what we have to do in the next 10 years uh, in short. All right. I think I, I don't want to really talk about binary neutral stars and neutral star black holes. Obviously, they're also very interesting and other things that we work on, but I just want, don't want to talk about this. I don't want to talk, I think, about too much about the systematics what uh, and, and what we need for LISA, because the, 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 the bottom line is simply we have to go about three orders of magnitude or at least two orders of magnitude in signal to noise ratio and several orders of magnitude in accuracy of the models. Um, so let's just jump to, to the conclusions. So, so one, one thing about the conclusions, I want to make basically two separate points. One is that we have to capture much more extreme physics, in particular very extreme mass ratios, but also extreme spins. For extreme spins, because there's a maximum spin, the current limit, you basically have a, a singular physical situation. And so the new effects where you, where you have a particle that goes to the uh, close to the horizon for a very long time and completely new physics is coming in. And this is something that we can not do at all right now. So this is really, we have to use uh, new methods and a lot of new synergies between numerical simulations and analytical GR and this um, big thing to do. And so, and then the other thing is of course, just the large, a larger, coverage of the parameters space. So the processing one and then the generic one, eccentric and uh, processing. And so one of the things there is, is that even, even if we would have enough uh, numerical relativity simulations, it would still be difficult because the, the functional dependence that you have over these large parameter spaces becomes more and more complicated. You really have to think about how to capture that and how to capture in such a way that you can really um, evaluate this very, very efficiently. So machine learning is one of the things that, that people investigate, but for various reasons that I'm happy to discuss, I think it's not sufficient by itself. And so you will have to come to a multi-pronged strategy for the modeling, but also for, for covering the parameter space with numerical uh, simulations. And so final thing that basically you want to say, so we are we're so far away from having generic accurate waveform models for, you know, for what we eventually want to do with third generation detectors. And with, uh, with Lisa, essentially we have to do this within the next decade or so. So this is the same time scale that we've had in 2005, which just uh, barely could do numerical simulations. And in 10 years, we developed the first waveform models for the first detection. And if you want to do this again for, for um, the next detectors, we have to again work on this uh, time scale for just uh, basically three PhD theses. Which I think I think a lot will be done. Whether we can do all the things that we want to do in that time is is another question. But there's certainly a lot of people working on it. So thank you very much. Questions? Thank you very much. It was a very interesting seminar. I, I have a sort of uh, historical curiosity. Mm -hmm. that, uh, I would say it's like from this uh, last statement. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible that with the first generation interferometer, we lack uh, some uh, detection that uh, not because of the low sensitivity of the instrument, but because our template uh, were not good enough? Well, I mean, you, you can, people have calculated, in fact, I, I don't remember now the number, but you, 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 you can calculate what was the single to noise ratio of for example, the first event in the previous generation, it wouldn't have no, 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 no model would have saved the day. <laughs> you know, you would have, you know, if, if you would have waited long enough, very long, that you have one that is really so close that it has even even higher SNR, but this this wasn't, you know, this wasn't quite wasn't quite sufficient. Although I don't remember the exact numbers. Uh, I think that also, I mean, the 
Um, it would have, so so if if I mean if if they would have had basically you can calculate what you know what SNR you would have required to to see it with the, even the very very suboptimal templates that they had at the time, which would have been certainly fantastic. So it's it, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't just the models, mm -hmm. but but certainly with the models that they had wouldn't, wouldn't have been possible. If, even with much higher. So there's any way we could analyze it with the the data of the that's the Probably some people have looked at it, but I don't think really because it's 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 you know. Uh, no, 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 it's, no, it's a lot. This is a, this is a lot of work because yeah. So there, there is people that is doing the. I mean, you you have a model analysis, mm -hmm. right? but uh, there is also this working group that does a model, and they also find the, the they also find the signals that are, that are model right. Like the, the unmodeled the, one, the, the, the virus the group, right? Yeah, yeah, there's a whole there's a whole working group on working on these things. Exactly. They, they can also find the, the, the other the things. Yes, 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 yes. They find, they find. I mean, they find a few, few fewer, but but uh, these these methods have become very, very sophisticated. And yeah. and so in fact, the, so the first detection wasn't initially detected by the matched filter search. It was by these other methods, mm -hmm. which are super fast. So for example, the, the first detection, right? There was so there was this this um, unmodeled searches were running. And and they found this essentially immediately online, and and then the, the parameter estimation you can do a simple parameter estimation by eye, and this was done within an hour, so so within an hour it was clear, basically what this is. It was the 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 the, the then it, then then um, you know the, the rest was the rest was checks basically. No, of course. <laughs> find uh, some signal that were still uh, too low to be uh, found by an unmodeled search, but maybe the modeled search. Uh, well, it, it is, I mean, it, it is, it is. Um, so the interesting thing is in fact that there's no simple clear answer. Okay. Because the thing is that if you do this, if you do these model searches, uh, the larger the parameters. So yes, let's say you have a fantastic uh, model which is super accurate and describes the whole parameter space of uh, precision, eccentricity, whatever you want. Okay, but it has so many degrees of freedom. It's also very prone to to give you false alarms, basically. Okay, because it it feeds the noise also because it has so many degrees of freedom. And so and and so when you when you make your searches more sophisticated and more sensitive, you will also get more false alarm. So so the for this for the Parameter estimation, we're using all the sophisticated model, models that we have. But for the searches, we're only using the dominant crowded pole, no precession, no eccentricity, no nothing. And so, 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 so for, for example, for the standard searches for eccentric binaries, they actually use the unmodeled search, which, which doesn't have this problem. It's less, it's less, uh, it's less um, efficient, but by this use. And then, and then other things was what, what I mentioned before, for this GW 1905-21, which is very, very interesting, um, but very, very short. Uh, this, this, uh, this can be perfectly well detected by these unmodeled searches. And the, you, can, you, know, you, can, you can assume that this is a, is a binary black hole, which is astrophysically very reasonable, but you don't certainly do not see it by the way for right? Um, and so this is almost suggested, which was just fine to that. Maybe I was surprised. Uh, you mentioned a lot what, what is the status regarding the, the spin because a couple of data mm -hmm. we have a top one, so we left mm -hmm. the spin. Uh, mm -hmm. the is the spin typically, is there any information that has been extracted from this, so the, the black hole spin? So, so yes, yeah, I mean, the, there, are, there are some binaries where, well, so, so there are some, there's, there's a number of binaries where you, where you can certainly convince yourself that the magnitude of the spin is quite low. And then there are some. There is a difference between, mm -hmm. between the final spin, mm -hmm. which I think mm -hmm. we, we, we have. It's not, not, not small, exactly, right. But, but but we have a, a good accuracy for the final spin. For the final spin, you have yes. a re reason. The spin and the yeah. Yes. yes. The final spin, there is a Th that can be quite high. So for example, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, they seem to be low. 
so that so that basically the, the initial black holes quite typically seem to have quite low spin. But there are others which have where, where the spin has been bounded away from zero, so they definitely have spin. And there are some where there's a there's a hint of precession. So the, the uh, for example, like here, this one would be a precession one. So you see that the, here the the uh, maximum of the posterior is in the orbital plane. It is bounded away from zero. So that would be definitely precessing. In fact, for this event, there has been a nature paper recently. Nature paper? Yes. Mm -hmm. Problem is, the problem is, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, one of, I'm, one of, I'm on it, in fact. But, but, but it's, it's part, so, so, so this was, this was uh, claimed to be the, this, the final um, oh, detection okay. of, of precession. The problem is that this may not be true because, because there's a, in this case, there's a serious, Problem with a glitch mm -hmm. in the in the noise, and it's it's actually not so clear what's what's going on. So I remember, I remember the simulations when when people were doing simulations of black holes without the spin, without the final one has already. I, I remember 0.7 or something like that. Right for, for for two black holes that are non-spinning, the, the orbital, the, exactly, but the orbital angle orbital gets Sorry. transformed into the the, into right. the, the spin and right. the momentum of the of the thing. Yeah. So. Which is not a, a small speed. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, one, one, one important astrophysical, I mean, once one gets more information about the spin of course, this can be one of the major markers of how these things have been produced. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and one, I mean, one, the modeling is, it's, it's before the first detection, people would ask a lot of astrophysicists. Well, what kind of spins do we have to model? And then they say, well, we don't really know. <laughs> but but also the, the, the answer wouldn't have really mattered because you have to be prepared for anything anyway. Uh, but but certainly one one very important question is how high can the spin really be? Because as, as you approach this curl limit, it gets really uh, much, 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 much harder to, to describe these things. So so um what would I, from the theoretical perspective is clear, when I just have to try whatever is possible. Yeah. That was a, a, a long, long ago, people working on X-ray emission and looking at the iron language system called air, but they were trying to model the spin of the accretion graph. And the answer was always 0.99 or something like that. Right? Yes. Uh, so very, yeah. But like think, here it's not. It's not well, but maybe this is because there is an, a selection effect. I mean, yeah, the, no. the, when you have a very accretion dense, yeah. a very active uh, uh, environment, maybe. Mm -hmm. It tends to spin up the yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if there is a dynamo, whatever there, there is. Right? Yeah. While these ones, I mean, they do have a merger, I mean, mm -hmm. probably all the matter is has been thrown away, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So, so, so anything going, you know, with above whatever 90.95 or so, it's, yeah, it's going to be very, model, right? it's going to be very, very, very difficult mm -hmm. to get that accurate. It's going to be very difficult. Um, and what, what, one of the problems is because in the kind of coordinate gauges that you use, the, then the black hole becomes very, very small and you have to use a lot of mesh refinement and you get this kind of yeah, physics yeah. where where um, information goes around the black hole close to the horizon many times. And, and but, but for example, the case of the kilonauer, this is actually related to short GRVs, right? Mm -hmm. And then one of the models for short GRVs is deformed like this. And then this this eventually collapses. I mean, so it was not related to this very fast rotating. Uh, the Glanova is that the measure you mean? Oh, Glanova is the Glanova is this. The Glanova is when you have this basically neutron rich ejecta, and then they they, yeah. they radiate yeah. later. And but and whereas the so the gamma ray signal come yes, it comes from this accretion yeah. disk and the very short behavior yeah, afterwards. Okay. Uh, uh, so I is going to be here until tomorrow in the afternoon. Yeah, after right? So if I'm going to be in my office, so if you want to discuss more with him, uh, then you are welcome. I didn't check whether there were any is anybody asking questions me? online. I didn't check that. Is there any questions online? Let's see. No, is there anything in the chat? No, there was nothing no, in the chat. Oh, wait, just one thing. You are, you are burning the Mare Nostrum. <laughs> are you thinking of uh, just, you know, like uh, GPUs or things? So is, at the moment, the codes are very difficult to, I guess, to... to, to the to, the to, numerical to... relativity. So, so we, are, we are very interested in, in GPUs for the 
So implementing these models basically, okay. but, for, yeah. but it's very difficult basically because since the Ashton equations have so many terms, yeah, yeah, yeah. compressing those lots of terms yeah, in the okay. GPUs is very tricky. You need to, to put it there. Yeah, it's but it's memory. It, need right, but, it's, but there are people working on it, but, but, but not me and what the prospects are. Okay. So there are no more questions. So let's thank uh, Sasha again. Thanks. Yeah. So I stop the sharing now. Yes.